All right, so real quick, can you just talk into the microphone so I can see if I need to adjust the levels? One, two, three, four. Today's That'll March work. 29th, 2017. <clears throat> We're here at Pasadena High School. It's been 40-something years since I've been on this campus. Broke my arm on this campus a long time ago. Really? Yep. Playing football? Playing football. Tell me a little bit more about that. You're uh, probably your, your most famous athlete of all Bert time. Cone? Huh? Hubert Cone? Nope. Mike Kirkland. He, he I stiffed on him on a kickoff and it ended up, my wrist swole up and then it ended up popping it later on. You know, so I broke it. It cracked it against in the game here and then fell on it over at South Houston and popped it up, had a swan neck fracture of it. So this is so it's interesting. Nice. Good memories here passing high school. Yeah. All right, here we go. Okay. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the sports medicine broadcast. We're talking about massage therapy with Wes Spates. Wes has been an athletic trainer for 40 years, been certified athletic trainer for 40 years, been doing massage therapy for uh, 18 years, and he currently is employed with the Houston Dynamo now that he's retired from uh, working at the, the stadium there in HISD here in Houston. And so he's worked at all different levels at the high school, at the college, at pro levels, and currently back working at the pros as the massage therapist. So the obviously the topic massage therapy um we're going to cover how to do it when to do it why why not some of the different things that you can use and then since i'm in the high school setting some of the things that you really got to look out for there in the high school setting so this episode is sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash massage therapy again sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash massage therapy all right wes welcome Thank you. Glad Welcome. to be here. Glad I could bring back the memories of your uh, broken arm. So, all right, we're going to start off. What is massage therapy um, and the types? So, massage therapy is probably one of the oldest types of uh, medicines where, you know, it's a healing touch. You've heard of, you know, touch really heals. Well, it shows compassion, it shows that you're caring, but it's also something that anybody can do. Uh, it's, you know, you can put a person on a machine or you can put a person, you can run a machine on a person, but the actual physical contact that you have is so important when you're dealing with your, your family, your, your student athletes, and the fact that it shows that you care about them, that you're willing to take time to, to personally get in touch with them and, and try and help them uh, overcome whatever's bothering them, whether it be a, a sore muscle, whether it be a torn muscle, whether it be from an injury. And a lot of times it's just from the stress and of life itself and from school and, and what's going on at home. Uh, it gives you a chance to really become one with the individual. All right. I know that definitely my wife says, Jeremy, you're an athletic trainer. Why can't you fix my shoulder? Can't you, can't you massage my shoulder all the time? So definitely it's taking the time to show that I care saying, yes, you're more important than the book I'm reading or the game I'm playing or whatever. I don't play video games, but that kind of thing, just putting that stuff aside and saying, I'll give you my full attention because you can't really do anything else while right. you're doing massage. It's, it's one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it's you and the patient, it's you and the, the athlete that you're dealing with. And it may, it may not be the best equipment to use to take care of the situation, but it's an equipment that you can relate each person can relate to and it does give you a a feeling of comfort it gives you a feeling of uh, that i care and i'm willing to help you and do what i can but it also gives you some some medical relief because anytime you can increase the blood flow to an area you're helping healing and by doing massage, what you're doing is you're pushing the old blood out and bringing the new blood supply in that has nutrients that can help heal that area. It's just like any of the other modalities we use in athletic training, whether it be a, a whirlpool, an ice bucket, an ultrasound, we're changing the temperature of that body part and either increasing the blood flow to the area or decreasing the blood flow to the area. 
Um, and that's the way the body heals itself. And as massage, you're actually working with the fluids in the body by moving them around, uh, the different pressures, the different techniques that you can use, uh, will help loosen things up or, or release things and allow you to have a better blood flow to the area so that you can heal quicker. Plus you have that personal contact. I know, uh, I've done some of the stuff. I remember one time you showed us some manual therapy at one of the Memorial Hermann clinics and I've done some of that stuff on, on athletes. And sometimes they're like, they hate me when I'm doing it cause it's very painful. And this, that's not exactly what we're talking about. We're, we're going to get to those, but they know that while I'm doing that, that I'm giving them my full attention and that, you know, they've, okay, Hey, can you do that thing for me again? And so I definitely understand the, the trust and the relationship there and knowing that you got that full attention and the healing touch. So I right, talk a little bit more about the types of massage. Well, when you're talking about massage, you have basically five different types of massage. You have friction massage, which basically you just do a cross, you know, you're running your hands real quick across and causing a friction area that's and causes some some light damage to the soft tissue but it increases the blood flow to that specific area you got the effarage where you're the nice long smooth strokes that you you're you're pushing the blood out you got the petrosage which is more of a kneading like if you're if you're working with a loaf of bread or the dough and you're you're working it and trying to to uh soften it up you got the tapotement, which is the the cupping or the uh, beating uh, with the so side of your hands or the palm of your hands. Uh, and uh, you've got the vibration where you're just going in there and loosening it up. All these are different techniques that a massage therapist has in order to increase the blood flow, to loosen the muscle up to where you can get in and work it to, to get to an area that really needs the help. Now, how you do that, you know, there's several different kinds of massage that you, you hear of. You know, you hear of, you know, basically the Swedish massage. That's what you go to most of these spa places. And, and it's just a nice, soft, even flow where it's not, you know, it's just the relaxing. You lay on the table and the massage therapist works for you. And it feels good. Half time you fall asleep. Half time. But mainly you're. You're just getting relaxed, and again, it's showing that the person's taking personal time and care <clears throat> and giving you that touch that helps you relax and get rid of some of the stress. But sometimes you need more than just the basic flush, and you need a deep tissue, and that's a little bit more uh you know intense. It's a little bit more painful, like you were saying it's a lot of times. A deep tissue massage is not comfortable. Uh, not too many people fall asleep during a deep tissue massage. Uh, they do like to cuss you a little bit, but you know that's part, <laughs> that's part of it. We've, as athletic trainers, we've been cussed several times. Oh yeah. Um, uh, but there's all different kinds. You know, there's uh, myofascial release. There's ART. There's, uh, you know, you know. There's even some foot massages where people massage you with your foot with their feet you know you pick up little things it's just like athletic training when you've been working for all these years and you see something that another trainer does and all of a sudden you pick that up and you run with it well you know in massage school we were taught how to do a swedish massage and then through continuing education uh we were able to pick up different tools to put in our bag now, one of the things that people ask me, well, what kind of massage do you do? Well, I consider myself, I do a therapeutic sports massage, which has deep tissue components in it. It also has ART components. It has myofascial release components. And, you know, and also part of my bag of tools, I have kinesio taping you know, which is an extension of the athletic training room and, and massage therapy. And we do all these things. Um, it's just like you said, I showed you one day in a seminar, a couple of techniques, and you put that into your tool bag. 
and we use it. Now, if I'm working on an individual and I have a come to a spot that's all knotted up and won't release, he can't doesn't have full range of motion, I'll sit there and spend a little bit more and I'll go a little bit deeper. I may even go in with my elbow instead of my thumb just to try and loosen that up. Now, is that very comfortable? No, but it may release it to where he feels better after I finish. He definitely doesn't feel good while I'm doing it. Uh, but sometimes just the nice soft melting of the butter of, you know, of the touch doesn't really work. And by melting of the butter, I like to, when I'm working on an individual's muscles, I like to put my thumb on it. And if you've ever put your thumb on a stick of butter, and just held it till that butter began to melt and you slide along that butter. That's the way I like to feel a soft, smooth, easy muscle. That's what a muscle should feel like when it's healthy. And so that's what I'm looking for. Now, sometimes you can't get that soft feel until you break it up and break up some of those adhesions that the body is, has a, brought in from the athletics or from doing something, whether it be typing on a computer eight hours a day or, you know, doing paperwork or you know you get everybody gets knots and everybody gets tight so you know we just use it in different fields as athletic trainers we seem to think we can attack anything get on it and and we seem to do it a little bit quicker than a lot of other people all right so currently it's your job with the houston dynamo are you there for every practice and then kind of tell me what it looks like at at that level, are they getting, is the same player getting a massage before and after the game just once a week? So tell me just what it looks like there. Well, right now I'm, uh, I'm part-time with the Dynamo. Uh, as you said, we just recently retired from uh, the high school setting and we're increasing it more and more each year with the Dynamo, the more massage. We're working basically four days a week, four to five days a week with the Dynamo and two days a week with the Dash, the, the women's team. And uh, it's basically two hours after practice and after the games. Um, this is the first year I've been traveling with the Dynamo. And we'll set up, you know, two-hour sessions. Now, as you can tell, there's 20-something people, 20-something athletes suiting up and traveling with the team. So that means I can't do all 20 of them in one session. Uh, I'll do like five to six 20 minute massages after practice. And so therefore I can get through all the players in a week's time, you know, so we can at least get to people. Some players get twice a week. Some people get twice a week and then they'll call me for a personal massage where I'll go and to their, their home and work on them for an hour, hour and a half to give them the more work than what they get at the stadium. Uh, it just depends on the individual player. Uh, younger players seem to think they're invincible and they can keep going. Uh, older players realize they need to take care of their bodies and the more body work they get, the better off they play uh, and the better they turn around. Most of the massages we're doing are for recovery. Uh, the coaches are pushing these athletes to the, you know, to get the best out of them and really pushing them hard. They get sore. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to where they can go back the next day and still play. Same temp, same principle as the hot tubs and the cold plunges. You know, you put people in a cold bath so that that will, can help recover. Well, we're doing the massage to flush all that used uh, oxidated blood out and bring in fresh blood so that the muscles can heal themselves from the micro trauma they had during practice. And that way, the next day, they feel a little bit better, and they can come back and practice again. Um, by no means is, are we doing just massage, because, you know, if a player's hurt, they're getting the book thrown at them. You know, they're getting, you know, electrical stem, they're getting game ready, they're getting hot tubs, they're getting cold tubs, they're getting physical therapy, they're getting massage therapy. You know, it's, it's just another component that we can give the athlete so that he can get back to performing at his top level. And again, all, all that other stuff is handled by Theron in, as, in the athletic training room. Theron and Chris. We've got two um, full-time trainers. We've got an intern trainer from University of Houston. Uh, we have Nathan over at uh, the physical therapy next door that helps great. 
with us a lot of work going on with him. Uh, then we have a full staff of doctors, whether it be chiropractors, uh, orthopedics, general practitioners that work with us on a daily basis. I mean, they may not be there, but they're on the phone. We can talk to them and, uh, Theron can, and Theron ends runs the whole program. He's got a, he's got a big load on his hands. And then the same thing with Megan over with the dash, you know, she has, her set of doctors and her, her chiropractors and myself. And, you know, we go through and uh, try to take care of the athletes as best we can possibly do. All right. So you're talking about you, you want the muscles to feel like kind of melted butter. Um, does the foam rolling and that kind of stuff, the self myofascial massage or self myofascial release really help you do your job or does it seem to make any difference? That's a great point. Uh, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, if you're getting a massage once a week to, to loosen this up and to get the recovery from the, the practice and stuff, that's after one practice. Well, you practice in the next day and you're practicing the next day and in between massage sessions, how do you get that out? You know, foam roller is probably one of the best ways to self-massage are the, uh, you know, you have the balls that you can roll on, whether it be a tennis ball or a croquet, a rack, uh, uh, lacrosse, lacrosse balls. Uh, some people even go down to the golf ball and that's really a hard ball to roll on. Uh, but then they have this, this eight inch balls and 11 inch balls that you can get on and get the bigger muscles as well. But, uh, it is a great tool to use if you don't have access to somebody's hands that can do it every day. Uh, you look at some of the, you know, elite athletes, they get massages both before and after, you know, you can't go to some of these track meets or some of these cycling events that have the, the big names there and they have their own massage therapist traveling with them, you know, where they're getting massaged before they go out and they get massaged after and those aren't the same type of massage. You know, you can't do a deep massage right before somebody goes out to practice. Or you can't, you can't do a deep tissue massage the day before a game because he's liable to be sore. If anybody's had a massage, if you're not used to it, you can have some soreness from the massage itself. Now, you should have more range of motion, some freedom of that muscle, but that muscle is going to be sore like you just got hit playing football the next day. It's bruised because I got in there and dug in and loosened it up. So it's not unusual to be sore the next day. I always do a follow-up with my private clients to make sure they're not cussing me too much the next day after I've, I've done a deep tissue on them because I know they're going to be sore and they're going to be tender. Now, whenever I've gotten a massage from – one of the massage places, they always say, you know, drink lots of water. Why is that important? Well, you want to replace and you want to keep hydrated. A lot of times when you're doing a massage, if you feel a muscle that's real tense and tight, it's dehydrated. You know, it doesn't have the fluids in that muscle that it's supposed to have. You know, it's used up all those, the fluids. So you got to rehydrate that. And you've been pushing some of this stuff out and you want to get to make sure the body has enough fluids to where the muscles can reabsorb those fluids for the recovery. If you don't, if now a lot of people have drink enough as it is, but it's a, it's a feeling that we feel that make sure you have enough fluids. You know, uh, a lot of time people don't drink a gallon of water a day. Everybody ought to drink a gallon of water a day just for general life. If you're an athlete, you probably should drink too. Uh, you know, you ought to be going to the bathroom on a regular basis. Uh, and a lot of people don't have to because they don't drink enough. Uh, but it does keep the soreness from getting in because it does replenish the fluids in the muscles. All right. So let's bring this back to the high school level a little bit. Okay. Um, when would I do a massage? So maybe I've got, uh, so we're talking about track, say a hamstring strain. Okay. Um, when am I going to do this? Am I going to do it before? Am I going to do it like right after he's hurt his hamstring? Uh, what type would I do? Again, I'm not a licensed massage therapist. 
So I'm just using some of the tools and tips that I've kind of picked up or heard. But you are a licensed athletic trainer. Correct. And we are taught in our athletic training background how to do a sports massage or how to do, you know, I hate using the word rub down, but that's in the athletic training field. We've always, the athletes have always, I need rub down. Um, and it's a delicate subject in today's world due to the fact that most of our high school athletes aren't 18 years old. We have to be careful about, you know, some of the things we do with our high school athletes and make sure that, you know, we do appropriate, you know, work on our athletes. A lot of times when you're dealing with a hamstring, how high up do you go? You need to check with your administration. You need to check to make sure that everybody's your, your doctors and what they will allow you and they will stand behind you to do uh, for a legal standpoint. You need to make sure the parents are on board with, with you touching their child. Uh, in the world of litigation today, you can never be too safe. Uh, I, you know, it's important to work on a, those athletes, but you need to protect yourself at first at all costs. You understand what I'm saying, Jeremy? Yep. Um, you need to always have witnesses, you know, and don't do it. Don't do anything that, uh, may compromise your position, but may make sure that you are communicating and communication is the biggest thing is make sure you're communicating with the kid, the parent and, and all parties involved. That way they know what you're doing and nothing will be, everything's above board and, and appropriate. Uh, you know, a hamstring runs from basically the, the, the ischium, which is the base of your, your buttocks to the, uh, to the back of your, to the bend of your knee. Well, you know, if you're working on that hamstring, a lot of times it's torn at the top and you need to make sure that everybody's aware of where you're going what you're doing and, and keep them properly draped and closed to where that you keep yourself out of trouble. But as far as, as, as type of massages you do, you, you can use uh, on acute injury. You probably wouldn't do it. Uh, you know, right then you might do some, some stretching to elongate the muscle and, but more because you really, the, that area that's damaged is bleeding right then. You, real, you really don't want to continue the bleeding, and that's what massage will do. It will bring more blood to the area. Now, after a day or two and it starts tightening up, then you'd want to get in there and start loosening that muscle up. And, you know, I would start with the long, flowing, easy, easy strokes to push the blood, the old blood out and try and get some new blood supply in. I'd start with some vibration to sort of just loosen that muscle up because if it's if it's been damaged, it's going to start trying to splint itself. It's going to start tightening up, and you're just going to want to gently loosen it up. Uh, after about three or four days, then you can get in there and start digging a little bit, uh, do some you know some friction massage or some kneading. Uh, but you know you basically you want to just just listen to it and feel it and and not do more damage. You know, a lot of times we can get in there and we can do as much damage as we can do good. Uh, and you want to be careful about pushing it, but not pushing it to an extent that you're doing damage. You know, uh, that's, you know, I, I laugh in the athletic training world. You know, we, we see an athlete sprain his ankle on Sunday and next Sunday he's playing just like nothing ever happened. And then you see Susie housewife who rolls her ankle playing tennis and four weeks later, she's still crying. She can't walk because it still hurts too much. Well, they don't realize that that athlete's been in the training room eight to 10 to 12 hours, plus taking modalities home with them, like electrical stem game readies. And they're getting, you know, 15 hours of treatment on that ankle every day. Whereas the housewife may see a PT three times a week for an hour. Maybe. You know, and that's, so you wonder why an athlete can come back in a short time and it, the ankle hurts for six weeks. Well, that 
who said that athlete's ankle's not hurting. He's just able to perform with it because he's got taped and he's been doing with these other modalities. Um, All right. So you said you want to push it, but not too hard. What are some of the things that, again, I don't do massage regularly. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not constantly doing this. I'm not formally trained in this. So what are, how will I know how to push it without going too far? If your athlete's climbing off the table when you're doing it, you're probably going in too hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, realistically, uh, you know, if it's an old injury, if it's, if it's a, um, you can push pretty hard. If it's a new injury, you know, you need to listen to the athlete and let the athlete tell you, oh, that really hurts. Or, but you also need to know your athlete. You know, a lot of times, you know, you as a high school trainer, you know, the athletes that can take more and take less, but you also have those athletes that you can just, it doesn't matter what you do. He's going to fight through it anyway. You know, you may, those are the dangerous ones because the ones that are, you're talking to that's, that is sort of not as, not as, I'm not saying it's tough, but it's not, can't take the pain as much as others. You, you know, they're going to let you know it's those tough guys that, sit there and take it that you can just sit there and dig in dig in and then they get out on the field and it, there's no results because they're still being damaged you're doing the damage to them you're still hurting them instead of helping them so you need to sort of listen to them and know what you know if you go in real deep one day and you really work that muscle over and he can't perform the next day you probably know you went too far that day so you back off you know it's more of a a feel, a touch, a get to know. Uh, and sometimes they'll let you know, oh, well, if that hurts, you know, don't, don't go there. That that's, that's too much. You know, most of them will tell you there's a few, they'll sit there and just suck it up and take it. But you know, most of them will let you know, especially if they know you. <laughs> All right. So if you've got five, 10 minutes at most with an athlete in the athletic training room, and it's someone you gonna you have that time just with them to work on an old injury or maybe they're just soreness like not not a hamstring tear or a, you know, a cute ankle sprain but like track season right now everybody's calves are sore that kind of thing so you got five to ten minutes what are you gonna do I'm gonna mainly just loosen them up and one of the things I like to one of my favorite techniques is either you know, some people, it's similar to ART, but it's or pin and stretch, where you place a, you put a point and either you have the athlete move the limb through, pulling the muscle underneath your point of, of pressure, or you're moving, you know, the limb through that range of motion yourself. So it's voluntary or involuntary. You know, a lot of times the ART is active, you know, where you're having the athlete move, but you're trying to loosen up that area in a real quick way. And that's the method I've showed you at the, at the conference. Uh, that's, that's a quick, you know, you're looking at one specific area. You can get to that area. Uh, if you're just a general flush, like at a track meet, you're, you got a, you got your quarter mile or that feels a little bit tight. Then I'd use more of a vibration with the FRIs, smooth strokes up, trying to get blood flow into the area, maybe going a little bit deeper with my FRIs to try and push, a more volume of blood through that muscle uh, and then do some vibration. Uh, a little topodement where you're, you know, ch- cry chopping on the hamstring. When this, I don't know that that's ever really beneficial and, you know, except if you've got something that you're just trying to break up. Uh, definitely not after that muscle's just been traumatized through, through the athletic event. Why would you traumatize it more after the event? You know, you're wanting to do more of a flush, try and get the lactic acid build up out and, and get a fresh blood supply in there so they'll feel better the next day. Mainly just, you know, you can't do a full massage, so you just got to do something. And if it's just one point, then I do more of the pin and stretch or the ART type method. All right. So if I have, uh, so I have one of my track athletes she comes in and I've used the, the roller, the hand roller, mm-hmm. and like I'm just pressing pretty hard, rolling on her calves, and she's kind of squealing. 
but she asked, I come back, comes back and asks me, Hey, can you do that for me again? I got a you know, race this week or whatever. So in that point, she kind of is coming up off the table, not, not really, but she's right. like, ah, but she intentionally came back. So at that point, am I, am I doing good in continuing to press hard that way? Because she's seen the benefit and she likes that, or am I probably doing more good than bad? It could be both. I mean, you know, that's a two edged sword. You're, you're walking a fine line. If it feel, you know, it's going to hurt, but you've got to remember when you start using tools like a, a massage roller or a, a knob or, or anything that's not your hands, you know, you can't really, you don't have that feel. You can't have that touch. So be careful if you're using one of those sticks that has all the rollers to try and roll out a hamstring or roll out, which are good tools, especially at a high school level where you're worried about improper touching and stuff. They're great tools because you're not actually touching, but you're getting some work done. You have to be careful because you can't really feel what you're rolling over. And so you want to go firm and that's a, that's a, that takes time. That takes feeling to getting used to and using those instruments to get that. Uh, Graston is a great, you know, scraping tool, but unless you've used it a lot, you can't feel what you really, what you really want to feel to know whether you're doing damage or whether you're not, you want to take and get to know, and it takes time and practice to, to get to feel exactly what you're doing. Uh, you know, me being where I'm at in my career and, and the younger trainers coming out, that's hard because, uh, you know, you take 30, 40 years experience and there's not a whole lot I haven't seen. You take a kid cr fresh out of college going in the training room, you know, he's, he hadn't seen everything. But yet he's got more gung hoism in him than I do. <laughs> right, a little bit more energy. He, he can he can conquer the world. I know I can't. But you know, it's one of those things that we, um, you know. And I feel, you know, back when I was going to school in college, you know, there wasn't but one or two trainers at each college, and the student trainers had to do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we got to work on the athletes. Now you look at the undergrad level at colleges, these kids are coming through. And I'll talk to one gal from a major Southeast conference school the other day, and she ran water and cleaned up for the first three years. She didn't get to touch an athlete <laughs> and she's coming out. She's got one year and then she's going to graduate and she's going to be an athletic trainer. Right. You know, that's a little scary. Yeah. You know, I was taping ankles in college level when I was still in high school, you know, which was, I was very fortunate, but that's a, uh, that was, I worry about the experience our kids are coming out with. And now we're coming in with the master's level uh, ATCs and they're, you know, that's just two years of exposure a lot of times. So these guys that are coming out are learning on the job. And, and of course Which I'm we, learning we on, always do. We always learn on the job. Even, you know, I saw things this year that I've never seen before. I uh, know, uh, yelling over at U of H that his kids are going to be eligible to sit for the CSCS once they finish the MAT program there. Uh, you mentioned that you got your LMT, your license in massage therapy about halfway through your career, about 20 years ago. Right. Uh, why did you decide to go get that? Um, 15 years of my career, I was a either an owner or a clinic director at a physical therapy sports rehab center. Um, I basically was working in a field without the right ticket. You know, I was blessed to know the doctors and the doctors trusted me enough to run their rehab center. Uh, I wasn't a physical therapist and never did claim to be a physical therapist, but uh, I did some of the same things that a physical therapist did a little bit more, sometimes a little more aggressive than your traditional physical therapy. But, um, uh, you know, I can't express the more tools you have in your bag. And, you know, a lot of times you look at people's cards and they have all these initials at the back of it. Well, 
that helps you when you're looking for jobs. You know, if you're a, you know, if you're a just if all you have is your license eight at, you know, like your state license here in the state of Texas, you're going to be limited to where you can work. Like me, I have a bachelor's degree and my license. I'm not nationally certified. I don't have a master's. I don't have any CSCS, LMT. I don't have any of those other initials after mine. So I'm pretty much and yeah, what are, limited. What's your teaching field? Uh, biology, biology or life science. Yes. Okay. Well, that, okay. You're an ATC. No, I'm an I mean, LAT. You're an LAT right. And you have a biology teaching degree. Well, you got a great chance of getting a high school job. Right. If you want to go up a level, then you have to have more. You have to have your, your master's degree. You have to have other, you have to have your athletic trainer certification through the national organization. Um, if you want to be recognized, you know, anything else you add sort of pulls you out. Like when Theron was looking for his assistant trainer, one of the things he would have liked to have got was an ATC MT you know, so when he got the, all the applications in, he started pulling those people first to see if any of those really fit his needs. Uh, if you look at the Texans, all, if I'm not mistaken, nearly all their trainers are PTs. So they're not only ATCs, but they have their state license, and they also have the physical therapy license. You know, if you can get your physical therapy assistance license, that makes you more valuable. You know, I've no one trainer that's a PA. Well, think how valuable to a sports, to, think how valuable to a sports staff at a college if you have a PA working as one of your trainers. You know, anything else you can add puts you up a little bit higher to where if you're job searching, you're going to be, uh, they're going to look for you first before they look at somebody that is a non teaching LAT. Because if you're a non teaching LAT, then what jobs can you get? You know, you've eliminated half of the high school jobs. Unless you know somebody at the professional level, you might get an internship, but then you have to know somebody there because there's other people applying that have more credentials than you. Right. So, so let's talk a little bit more about your journey. So you're a full-time athletic trainer. You said when you went to get the licensed massage, were you working in the high school setting or you were still in the clinic setting? I was in the clinic setting. Uh, I had several of my clients wanted me. I worked mainly on backs and necks in the clinic. And I had several clients that wanted me to continue to work on them outside the clinic. Well, that got out of my realm, you know, my what my license allowed me to do. Uh, also, I was in a move, change of job to where I wanted to uh, have a nor another source of income. And uh, I, my kids were beginning to go to college. We needed more income from the family point of view. And so at HISD, we had some flex schedules, so I had more time than a tr than a traditional trainer who goes to the school at 6.37 in the morning and gets off when the last event is over. We worked more of a 40, 48-hour week, so I either had my mornings off or my evenings off. So I had time to do some things, and massage therapy, which w went hand-in-hand hand with what I've done because I've been doing massages all my life, just as an athletic trainer, mm -hmm. I just went and got the appropriate license for it. At the time, it was a 300-hour course. Now the state requires a minimum 500-hour course, uh, and then you have to pass the state test. But uh, I just felt like it was important for me to have to, uh, to set myself apart from some of the other trainers. But I also felt it was important for me to have if I wanted to get back to working with the professional level. And that's how I got back in with the diamond. I wouldn't be working professional sports now if I didn't have my massage therapy license. Right. All right. So you did the 300 hour course. You had, you had the flexibility in your schedule. Um, so right now you, you do private 
massages or whatever for uh, those clients. And I know there's been talk recently or athletic trainers always seem to be talking about, you know, we shouldn't take the side jobs that are $25 an hour. We should, you know, 30 or 35 or whatever an hour. Uh, what are you currently charging for a massage? You push my hot button there, Jeremy. Um, there's a huge inequity in the athletic training field right now. Um, I went four years to school. I've got, a license and I've got a certification in athletic training. Well, actually my certification is retired now, but my license is still new. Massage therapy. I took a 300 hour course. I make $80 an hour doing massages. <laughs> it doesn't take long to, you know, as I, I've talked to a couple other athletic trainers and they've gone in and got their massage license too. If you do, you know, realistically, if you do three massages a week, you can subsidize your athletic training job by a thousand dollars a month. When you, if you think about it, and that was one of the things I was trying to get, and it's nothing to get three to have three massages a day. I mean, in three massages, that's three massages a week. I'm sorry, not right. a day. You know, you're making two hundred forty dollars a week for four weeks. That's a thousand dollars. When you look at some of these jobs that are advertised, that we need a trainer to cover soccer all day for twenty dollars an hour. You know, we limit our as a trainer. We we're belittling ourselves. Um, we're tied to so many of us are tied to school districts uh, salary structures. Uh, we're, we're tied to coaches and athletic directors who are coaches that, um, are used to working for nothing. You know, realistically, when you look at the number of hours they put in and the wages they're making, they're not making anything. And we, but it's a job. If you look at other states, they don't even have the jobs we have. In the state of Texas, we're blessed to have training jobs that pay sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Right. Uh, so I'm not putting that down, but realistically, when you, if you're making seventy thousand dollars, you're making, you know, thirty five, forty dollars an hour. And yet, we take these extra jobs at twenty. We take these extra jobs, you know, and so many of them, you know, this is a good time to volunteer and, and, and give back to your service. Well, my service is valuable. You know, my time is valuable, especially for you who have young kids at home and you don't see your wife enough as it is. And yet you're going to volunteer a weekend to go cover a, uh, a soccer tournament. That yeah. they're charging lots of money out of the other players for. Right. Right. And somebody's making money. You know, or you go work a camp and you know that there are people making thousands of dollars and they're giving you twenty dollars an hour. You know, that's I have a I have a problem with that. Um I don't do a whole lot of contract training. I have in my past because I've needed to. But it's a uh I I think we need to be careful as athletic trainers accepting I think we need to charge for our services and I think we ought to be reimbursed for them. Uh, you know, you see so many of your ex athletes coming back and thanking you for what you did when they were in school, because you meant something to them. You, you became part of their personal personal lives and you got them through some trying times and you are somebody special. Uh, so I think it's important that you, uh, feel a worth of a self-worth that you charge what's appropriately and not take the, the, uh, the lesser amounts. So again, it's definitely another opportunity for you as an athletic trainer to advance your skills, to better treat the athletes that you're working with now to op also open up opportunities to work with different sports, different areas, or, if you were looking for something other than athletic training, uh, if you're doing massages all day long, it's pretty labor intensive. 
but it may be that you set your own schedule or, you know, you only work three days, four days a week, all day, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, real quick, Wes, what would it take to replace a $70,000 salary? Like, is it is it a full day? How difficult is a full day of massages? A full day of massages between four and five massages a day, realistically. If you're doing more than four or five massages a day, you're going to be wearing yourself out. Uh, you may get one massage, like I did. I did five massages yesterday. Uh, one of them was an hour and a half, hour and forty-five minutes. So you know, basically, that's two massages. So you got to be careful about doing too many, uh, uh, because you can burn out. Um, you know, but a full-time massage therapist, if he does twenty-five massages a day a week. Mm -hmm that's considered a full load. That's considered a very full load. So, um, you know, you, you don't want to do too much, especially just getting in. Now, fortunately, when you're building your own practice, you're going to gradually work up to where you're used to what you're seeing. You're going, mm -hmm. um, the massage therapy as a group doesn't have a big retention. You know, we license several thousand, a couple thousand every year. But they get into it, and they see these, oh, well, I get charged $70 an hour. I get charged $80 an hour. I get, you know, there's different levels. And they start multiplying that out by 40, and they get this huge salary at the end. Well, you can't do that. Number one, if you make 12000 your first year on, out on your own, you've done real well. Right. Because you've got to have time to build up your clientele to where you can get some return ease. Because you're not treating 25 new patients every week. You know, you've got some people that do weekly. You do some people that do monthly. you got some people that do every three weeks. And they just fill in the slots. And then you got to juggle your schedule. Uh, but for myself as a massage therapist, as an athletic trainer, we're in the service business. When do you work? You know, you work when you need to work. Right. You don't, you don't set your schedules by any means. Uh, you know, you're told you got an athlete, you got your star quarterback hurt. You're going to be in here at six o'clock in the morning working on him before school. You're going to have him in here during lunch. You're going to have him before practice and you're going to have him after practice. Or else coach is going to find another trainer that will. <laughs> No, but you know, it's just that you do what you have to do. If you run your own private business, you're going to work the schedule that your clients need you to work. For instance, in my 18 years, Sunday's been my busiest day. And you look and say, well, why Sunday? Well, that's when everybody's off. That's when they can take care of themselves. That's when they're the off day is. So I work on Sundays, mm -hmm. you know, I'm open from after, after 12, to win on Sunday, you know? Um, so it's something that, you know, you have to monitor yourself because I'll work seven days a week. Other people won't, but you know, I've always worked seven days a week and, you know, as an athletic trainer, you, you work every day. And that's, and that's sort of what sort of blends my, the two careers are, are work hand in hand as far as I see. Um, but you can't, you got to listen to your body and you don't want to be doing too many because then you're not giving quality work. You know, if you get up to, you know, like after the marathon one year, I did 13. Well, 13 would kill me now, Yeah. <laughs> but you know, there was, there was a need. So I, I worked just like an athletic training room, you know, during two days, you know, you're here from five to, till 11, you know, every day, you know, that's why we, that's why we were raised. So that's basically the way I've taken on my massage therapy too. You know, you work when you need to work. Uh, it's a little tough working for some, for other people, you know, and that's what most massage people have to do. They, and you don't get the full amount. Of course you ha don't have to pay for your mileage. I mean, they, you, they pay for all the sheets. They pay for the lotion. They pay for the table. Working for myself, I have to pay for all that. So technically, my charges 
at eighty dollars an hour, I have cost factors that come out of it. Right. But uh, you know, I still would prefer to work for myself than work for an establishment that takes fifty percent of the income. All right. If we were going to learn more about massage therapy, so maybe I want to incorporate a little bit more without going through the full five hundred hour mm-hmm. LMT. Uh, what we, where would you recommend? There's all kinds of continuing education. You have to have continuing education credit as an athletic trainer. And this is a real good question. I'm glad you asked this because I've changed my philosophy on what courses I take now, you know, used to, we would go to the basic swatter. We go to the national trainers convention we go to the basic trainers convention. Well, what I'm looking at is instead of going to basic conventions to get my CEUs, I'm looking at what tool can I put in my toolbox that will help me take care of my clients. I've taken an ART course that was, you know, an expensive course that I took, but it gave me a new tool. You know, I've taken a, uh, um, I've taken several myofascial release courses that gives me a different tool that I can use. Uh, I've taken, you know, kinesio taping to where, you know, that gives me a different tool. It gives me a different thing I can work with. Uh, You've got Graston. And a lot of these courses can be both, both athletic training and can be, uh, massage therapy courses. So I'm getting CEUs for both as you're going through. So what I would do is I, if I was an athletic trainer and wanted to get more involved in athletic training, I would look for some, I mean, more massage work or more hands-on work in athletic. I would take courses that would benefit you in those type skills to give you extra tools to put into your tool bag to help your athletes and not just go to uh, a knee clinics that tells you how to evaluate a knee and tells you how to necessarily rehab a knee and to to do surgery on a knee and stuff like that because we've been there we've done those get something else that you can add to your program uh, add to your tools that you can help your athletes all right so if somebody wants to contact you what's the best way to do that Wes? um contact me with my phone uh my phone number is 281-615-8289 or email at westspates at yahoo.com. Uh, but, you know, uh, and one of the good things about massage and athletic training, I'm drawn to the athletes, the active people. Now, do I have general general people that, you know, the the worker that works at does data entry eight hours a day, 10 hours a day. I have those clients, but most of my athletes are physically active. You know, they're, they're doing Ironmans. They're running marathons. They're, they're, uh, uh, doing Pilates. They're instructors of Pilates or yoga. Uh, you know, they're physically active individuals. So it's, it's not, you know, it's sort of a crossover and both both i've still got my foot in both buckets in other words i'm not totally out of one but not totally out of the other and as you know athletic trainers can't work behind four walls we go crazy right <laughs> we got to have some outside we got to get outside we got to see people and i do mainly a lot of out calls i go to people's homes i go to people i go to their homes and work at them in their environment. I still work a lot of races on weekends. Uh, it's good exposure, but it also keeps me in that competitive area. As long and working with a dynamo, I still have the opportunity to work with high quality athletes and in a very competitive nature. I'm still in a locker room type setting. You know, if you'll listen to some of these professional athletes talk after the end of their career, what do you miss the most? The most thing they miss is they miss the companionship of their teammates, the locker room. You know, it's not the practices, it's not the weights, it's, it's the companionship of the locker room and the friendship they have there. 
So by doing the dynamo, I'm still in that atmosphere. And that's, uh, that's one of the neat things I have going there. So. All right. This is national athletic training month when we're recording this. So I would like for you to share an athletic trainer or thank an athletic trainer that has been important to you in some form or fashion. Uh, there's been three that have really been important in my life. The first one was Tom Wilson, the, the late Tom Wilson from the university of Houston, who, uh, I met when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, he took me in under his wings and, uh, I went to South Houston, uh, and he lived in the neighborhood and he took me in and had me visiting U of H. And, uh, by the time I was a soft uh, junior in high school, I was on the U of H sidelines helping at home games with U of H. Uh, I'd like to thank Alan Eggert at Rice. He, uh, he took me in and gave me my last year of apprenticeship, uh, which was invaluable because I was able to see two college programs and how they were vastly different, but vastly the same. I mean, you know, basically the same because there was two, there's never just one way to attack, you know, a problem. There's, there's different people's different thoughts. You know, they tape different. They thought different. They reacted different. Uh, I got two deals. I had two worlds. And probably the probably the one that's uh, most influenced in my life was uh, the late Logan Woods, the longtime uh, trainer at Houston ISD. Uh, he became my mentor. He became uh, the guy that I went to when I had problems. The guy that I need when I needed to know something. He he was there for me. He would always sit there and talk to me and tell me what I needed to do and what I needed to hear, even though I didn't want to hear it. You know, he was that, he was that mentor that just was my rock. Uh, and I, I'll always look up to those three guys for my, my athletic training experience. All right. So this is again, national athletic training month. When we're recording this, by the time this is released, it's almost time for the NATA convention in here in Houston. So make sure you check me out at the Frio Hydration booth. I'll be at the Frio Hydration booth doing some recordings, interviewing guests or just listeners of the Sports Medicine Broadcast, which is you. Check me out there, Frio Hydration booth at the NATA 2017 Houston. Also, if you are an international listener and I want you to reach out and contact me, I want to try and get you on the show and hear your story. So if you're listening internationally, make sure you reach out and get in touch with me so I can have you on your show or at least share your story. So for Jeremy Jackson, West Spates, Sports Medicine Broadcast, this is, again, sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash massage therapy. And that is a wrap. Thank you.